Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. We very, 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 very much appreciate that. Get the mouth in here. Uh, on our uh, continuing prayer list, as we said this morning, uh, Jacqueline's scheduled for surgery April 19th, so continue to pray for her. Uh, continue to remember Julie and the loss of her, uh, her brother Robert. Uh, so we offer her our condolences and continue to pray for her and that family as they grieve through that process. Uh, don't have any updates on uh, anybody else. Again, if you know of something, let me know and we'll, we'll put that on there. Uh, so we do have, we mentioned this morning, we are going to have Brad Harrod with us, Lord willing, in October. And so I gave you all, a, these are a list of the topics uh, that he does. He can also customize if y'all think, oh, all these are terrible. Well, you tell me something else, he can do something else. But these are the ones he typically does. So if you'll take those home and just kind of look over that and uh, maybe, you know, next Sunday or sometime, uh, circle the one that you like. You don't have to put your name on it, uh, but just circle one that you would like and we'll see if we can come to some kind of consensus. And if not, we'll just pick one. But I did want to see what you all were interested in and what you wanted. And a lot of these I've heard myself and, and they're really, really good. So uh, you probably really can't go wrong with any of these. But anyway, just take those home, look them over, pick one, circle it bring those back to me in a week or so, and we'll kind of go from there where I can kind of tell him uh, what we want to do. Uh, gospel meetings, uh, East Side, I got a thing in the mail today. So East Side is doing a, a gospel meeting on May the 12th through the 15th. So coming up here in about a month or so, Joe Wells will be doing our speaking. Uh, that'll be seven o'clock each night. Uh, Greens Lake Road has the gospel meeting. I told y'all about this a while back, but you may have forgotten that uh, they're having a gospel meeting, which started today. And so uh, I'll be speaking in that Wednesday night. So I'll be here. I'll be down there Wednesday night. Um, but anyway, that's 7 o'clock each night as well. If you get an opportunity, I know Chattanooga is a long way down, but if you get an opportunity, there's some, other than me, there's some really good speakers in there. Um, then a reminder again, we uh, on May the 5th, we're going to start back with our uh, fellowship uh, dinners or lunches after the morning service. So please plan to stay for that. Uh, and we're going to try to do that the first Sunday of each month, so beginning in, in May. So I think that would be a good, good thing for us to do. Get that Hadn't done that since before COVID. So uh, high time we got back to uh, doing that and socializing and just spending some good quality time with each other. All right, I think uh, that's all I have. So if you uh, get out your song books, we're gonna turn the song service over to Brother Cheryl at the appropriate time. Brother Maurice has our opening prayer and then Brother Steve will lead us in our dismissal prayer. Please turn to number 119.
and help us to remember that you gave it to us for a purpose. Help us to use it in the right way. Help us to learn from it. Go with us today as we study another portion of that word. And ask you to be with those who cannot be here tonight. And ask you to be with those who made a decision not to be here tonight. We ask you to help us to reach people and do the thing that would, would influence people toward your word. We ask you to be with those who are going through difficult times in their health, both their spiritual health and their physical health. We ask you to be with them, guide them, and, and somehow they turn to you for guidance. We ask you to tonight be with us as we as we think about the word, but also to be mindful that in this world that we live in, we're living in a very dangerous world. And we know that the Bible says there will be wars, but we do pray for those who are conducting those wars that they somehow, somehow realize that they're dealing with human lives and help them realize that they're your, that, that, that they are your creation also. We know that we know that's a very impossible thing for us to ask for, but, but we know that everything is possible through you. Go with us and guide us and help us to be attentive to time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please turn your song, song book to number one. Fourteen. We sign this before the list. I stand the amazing the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, 
21, to be the song of invitation I can believe. If you would be turning in your Bibles to the book of Luke. We'll be looking at Luke chapter 7 tonight. You know, Jesus often uses parables or made use of parables to teach valuable spiritual lessons. Now we know, we've talked about this often, that a parable is it's a simple story that is used to illustrate a, a moral or a spiritual concept. It's a way of teaching. So it's a kind of a comparison, <coughs> if you will, between something that is common or something that is familiar to people on the one hand and comparing that to some kind of spiritual truth that so people can make application that's that's what a parable is and so tonight we want to take a look at one of the parables of jesus which is commonly called the parable of the two debtors so if you would look at luke chapter 7 we want to see some lessons that we can learn from this parable so luke chapter 7 we're going to begin reading uh, in verse 36, we're going to read through verse 47, where we see this parable. And one of the Pharisees desired him, being Jesus, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and being and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment now when the pharisee which had bidden him saw it he spake within himself in other words he didn't say this out loud this is what he was thinking spake within himself saying this man if he were a prophet would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? Now there's the parable. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. In other words, Simon gave the right answer. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. So you answered correctly. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So just to kind of recap here, what's going on? We have Simon, who is a Pharisee, one of the, the Jewish leaders who typically most of them were against Jesus. But Simon had invited Jesus to, hey, why don't you come over to my house and for dinner? We'll sit down and we'll eat. And so Jesus accepts his invitation and, and he goes over to the man's house well somehow a sinful woman had learned this she had found out that Jesus was going to go eat at this Pharisee's house and so she shows up uninvited obviously she wasn't invited by Simon to come there but she shows up and she brings with her an alabaster box of ointment now alabaster was a, a soft mineral rock they used it for carvings 
typically pretty expensive. And most ointments at that time were hard to come by, so they were typically pretty expensive as well. So she brings this with her. And so while she's there, she is crying. In fact, the Bible, Jesus said she is weeping. So that's more than just, you know, sniffling a little bit. I mean, this woman is bawling, as we would say. The, the faucet is turned on, and she is weeping uncontrollably uh, because she knows that she is a sinner. That's not something that she's not aware of, and she knows that she needs forgiveness. She needs to be forgiven for what she's done. So she washes his feet with her tears. She dries his feet with her hair. And then she anoints his feet with this oil. And the whole time she's doing this, again, she is kissing his feet. So we see that Simon is very critical of all this as he watches this unfold. Now, he doesn't verbalize it, but he's thinking in his mind he, as he looks at this, and, and Jesus is not rebuking this woman at all, not telling her, get away from me. And he's thinking, look, if Jesus were a true prophet, he would know what a horrible sinner this woman was, and he would know he doesn't need to be touching her. He doesn't need to let her touch him because she's unclean. She's a horrible sinner. So he's questioning, well, if you were really the son of God, you would know that. And that's what he's thinking in his mind while all this is, is going on. And so Jesus, of course, can read Simon's thoughts. And so he gives him the parable to illustrate what's going on here and, and how Simon has the wrong attitude and this woman has the right attitude. So let's take a look. That's kind of the background. Let's look at the parable itself. And so Jesus tells him a story. Okay, there's a man and a couple of guys came to borrow money from this man. Okay, and so one guy borrowed 500 pence and you had another guy who borrowed 50 pence, okay? Now, if you convert that into today's money, 500 pence would be about $75, and 50 pence would be about $7.50, okay? So obviously one debt is quite a bit larger than the other one. And so both of these men, for whatever circumstance, they were unable to repay it. They, they just, they didn't have the money, they couldn't pay it back. And so the man who had loaned them the money, he says, you know what? Don't worry about it, boys. I'm just going to write this off. You don't have to pay me back. Don't worry about it. Just forget it. Let's just call it in. So he tells both guys that they, they don't owe him the money anymore. And so Jesus asked Simon, and he says, okay, now I want you to tell me of the two debtors, which one of those two guys do you think will love the creditor more, will have more affection for the person who forgave their sins? And Simon correctly answered, he said, well, I suppose it would be the guy that had borrowed 500 pence because he had a bigger debt that was forgiven. So he would probably appreciate that more and, and have more love for the creditor. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. That's, that's the right answer. It's what you should have been able to discern from this. So what are we to get out, out of all this? Well, then Jesus then goes into a contrast says, okay, well, you got the parable and you gave me the right answer, but how does this apply to Simon and, and to this woman that he's talking about? And so Jesus offers this contrast of the courtesy and the love that Simon had failed to show Jesus, contrasted with the courtesy and love that this sinful woman had bestowed upon Jesus. And he's trying to get Simon to see what the difference here. So first of all, when you think about Simon, Jesus tells him, says, look, first of all, Simon, why can't, you know, yeah, you invited me to dinner, so that, that's a nice thing, but when I came into your house, you didn't give me any water to wash my feet. Is that a big deal? Yeah, it's a big deal. And we talked about that a little bit this morning, right? Remember that they're wearing sandals. They, they don't have expensive shoes on and they don't have socks on and so their their feet are exposed the roads are not paved so everything's dirty or if it's been raining it's muddy and you know so your feet are going to be pretty nasty so it was customary you come into somebody's house you you needed to wash your feet okay now if someone was not wealthy they would offer to 
give you some water so you could wash your own feet. But if somebody was wealthy, they typically they would have a servant to do that. As I said this morning, the lowest servant would be given that nasty job of cleaning somebody's feet. Well, Simon, being a Pharisee, probably had a fair amount of money. Uh, it doesn't say. But in either event, he didn't, he didn't send a servant to wash Jesus' feet, nor did he even give Jesus water so Jesus could wash his own feet. Well, that, that was customary at the time. So that was kind of a snub on that part. And then Jesus said, you didn't even kiss me. Now, we're not talking, obviously, about a romantic kiss. But it was customary at the time, somebody come to your house, you would greet them with a kiss. That, that's what you're supposed to do. So to not do that would have been considered rude. To, you know, I come into your house and you don't even give me the customary greeting of a kiss. And he tells Simon, you, you didn't do that either. So you didn't need water to clean my feet. You didn't kiss me like you were supposed to. And he says, you didn't even take the trouble to anoint me with any oil. And that wasn't something you had to do, but it was a nice thing to do. And Jesus said, well, you didn't do that either. Now, on the other hand, what about the, the sinful woman? The one that Simon's looking down his nose. Oh, this horrible woman, this shameful woman. Jesus said, well, what about her? Let's contrast her to what you did. So the sinful woman, she humbled herself. She showed humility. She had a, an attitude of service toward Jesus. And so she, not only does she wash her, his feet, but she's washing it with her tears because she wasn't offered any water either. But she is crying so much that she's got enough tears that she can wash Jesus' feet. And then, how does she dry it? Well, she uses her hair to dry the feet. Now, I think, I don't know about y'all, but I'm thinking that's pretty gross and disgusting to use your hair to dry somebody's feet. Now, granted, she just washed them, but still, but that doesn't concern her, doesn't boss. She humbles herself, and she does that. While she's doing this, she is kissing his feet. In fact, Jesus said, she hadn't stopped kissing my feet since I walked in the door. She's just kissing him and kissing him and kissing him. You know, it, it's a big deal. She understands that. Simon, you didn't even give me one kiss, but, but look at what she's doing. And then she takes this expensive oil and she anoints Jesus' feet. And again, Simon didn't anoint him with any oil. So Jesus is pointing out, look, look at what this woman has done. Which of the two of you is showing more love for me, you or this so-called sinful woman that you're talking about. And so because of the love that she had and the humility that she demonstrated, Jesus is going to forgive her for all the sins that she has committed because it's clear that this woman has repent. She's repenting. She's got that godly sorrow, and that's what God wants us to do. So let's take a look at what was the purpose of this parable. What is God trying to get across to us when we look at this parable, well, first of all, to show how the woman's behavior, the sinful woman, how her behavior was pleasing unto God. Not the sins that she had committed, but the state that she was in right now, this state of repentance. Okay, This woman, yes, she had sinned a lot, apparently, because Simon knew about this. So it's pretty obvious because we look at it and go, well, Okay, it says she's a sinful woman, but isn't everybody sinful? Well, yeah, everybody's sinful. So probably what that means is she was really bad. And it was a very public, well, this was a very immoral woman that she had done things that everybody knew about. Okay, some people sin in secret. Maybe nobody knows about it but them and God, but apparently that wasn't the case with this woman. Right? But Jesus wasn't from around there, but he thought, well, if you were a true prophet, you'd be able to tell how bad this woman was. So she had sinned a lot, but she is showing genuine sorrow here. I mean, she's, again, she's not just crying a few tears. She is weeping uncontrollably because she knows how horrible that she's been. So she wants to make it right. She wants to repent. She wants to turn her life around from the sinful behavior that whatever it was that she's been engaged in up to this point. So that's one thing that God wants us to see. Secondly, to show Simon according to his own reasoning, the, what he's thinking in his mind, to show Simon how little love he actually had for the Lord compared to this awful, shameful woman that's such a sinner. 
but she had so much more love for Jesus than Simon did. And so Jesus is trying to point this out to him. You know, you're judging her, but you're not displaying the proper attitude that you ought to have. This woman, she showed a tremendous love and respect uh, for Jesus. And that's what Simon should have done, but he didn't. And then thirdly, we notice that it gives Jesus the opportunity to show, uh, or to justify his own conduct. Right? Because Simon is thinking, I can't believe you're letting this horrible woman touch you and do all these kind of things, and she's unclean, and you obviously don't know that because you're not a true prophet. And you know, he's just kind of beside himself about all this. But this allows Jesus to demonstrate why he's doing this, to, to justify his conduct. Why is he accepting this behavior from this woman, what, what she's doing for him? So First of all, it demonstrates that he did know she was a sinner. Simon said, you, you don't even know that. Yes, he did. Because remember, Simon is thinking that. He doesn't verbalize it. But again, if we go back and look at this, look at verse 47 again. Jesus said, wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many. Simon didn't tell Jesus that she was a horrible sinner. He knew it because he was a son of God. So he's able to demonstrate that. And then he also is able to show that he knew what Simon was thinking. We can't read people's minds. Some people expect us to, but we really can't do that. But the Son of God could do that. So he's able to demonstrate to Simon, I know what you're thinking. You don't even have to say it. I know exactly what you're thinking. And here's why you're wrong. And so that's kind of the purpose of the parable. Now, how do we apply this? To you and me, what, what lessons can we take out of this? Well, first of all, we need to understand that men are sinners. Men being mankind here, we are sinners. Look at Romans 3 and verse 23. We are sinners, and we have to understand that. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So who has sinned? Everybody. You, me, Everybody. Yeah, this woman was a sinner. Well, what about Simon? Well, he was too. Now, he wasn't thinking about that. Okay? So we need to realize that we have all sinned. Secondly, we need to realize that we are unable to pay for our sins. It's like the debt here. And so you had two men that were debtors and they just they didn't have the money. They couldn't pay it. You and I as sinners, we are not able to pay the debt that we owe God. We cannot pay enough for the forgiveness of our sins. We need to understand that. We need to have our debt forgiven, but we're unable to pay it. Then thirdly, we want to notice that God loves us and he is willing to forgive us. He knows that we can't pay it. He knows that there's nothing we could do to make up for what he's done for us. He knows that. But he loves us and he's willing to forgive our sins. He wants to forgive our sins. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But now notice this in verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So we need to recognize that we are sinners, not just pointing the finger at everybody else, but looking in the mirror, go, yeah, that, that's me too. We are sinners, but God loves us and he wants to forgive us for the mistakes that we made. Now, we've got to also realize though that that forgiveness is conditional. God is not going to forgive us for no reason. It's not unconditional. Well, you sin all you want. I'm just going to overlook it. That's not how that works. Okay. Look at Hebrews 5 and verse 9. So man is forgiven by God. God is willing to forgive us, but it is not unconditional. It is in fact conditional on our behavior. Look at Hebrews 5 and verse 9. And being made perfect... He became the author of eternal salvation to who? Unto all them that obeyed him. 
It's conditional. I, I'm not going to get God's forgiveness for no reason. But if I'm willing to obey God, then he wants to forgive me. This woman here, she repented. She had godly sorrow. That's what God has commanded us to do. If you are a sinner, you need to repent. We have to obey God and do that. Well, this woman, she was willing to do that. So it wasn't an unconditional forgiveness. She had something to do on her part, but she's doing that. So for us, we need to show, we need to have a love and a gratitude for God, like this woman did. So first of all, we've got to recognize our sins. Simon hadn't really thought much about his own sins. He didn't think anything about it, right? Uh, so he didn't extend all these courtesies to Jesus like the woman did. He needed to do that, but he didn't do it, right? He was so eager to focus on the sins of this woman that, again, he, he didn't want to look in the mirror and say, well, you know what? She's a sinner, but so am I. He didn't want to focus on that. Well, it's really easy for you and me to do the same thing, to point out the shortcomings of other people. I can't believe her. I can't believe she does that or, or he does this or, and, and not look at ourselves. And yeah, it may be really bad what that other person's done, but if I'm not obedient to God, then I'm, I'm just as guilty. My sin may be different than the other person's, but I'm still sinning against God. And we need to look at that. And Simon wasn't uh, looking at it. So we need to show love and gratitude to God just like this woman did because we're all sinners and we all need forgiveness. So we should love God. We should thank God because if we consider everything that he's done for us, and apparently that's what this woman had suddenly done. She had realized everything that God had done for her and how bad she was behaving toward him. And she wanted to change that. She wanted to fix it. Well, we need to remember what God did for us. First of all, God gave his son for us. John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God gave his son. We've often said, I don't want to sacrifice my child for anyone. But God did. Christ gave his life for us. Romans 5 and verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't die for me because he owed me. I owe him more than I could ever repay. It's a debt I can never repay. And yet he did it for me anyway. So we need to be grateful for that. We need to notice that if we are grateful to God, if we really love God like we should, then our love should translate into obedience. Look at John 14, verses 23 and 24. If we love God, we will obey him. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Right? If you keep my words. Notice verse 24. You see the contrast. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. This comes straight from God the Father. He said, if you're not going to keep that word, then you don't love God. Okay? And we've got to understand that. So if we love God, we will obey him. Also, if we love God, we will be willing to sacrifice for him. Look at Romans 12. Verses 1 and 2. If we love God, we will sacrifice for him. The Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's not unreasonable. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're to be a living sacrifice. That doesn't mean we have to get up on a cross like Jesus did, but we need to make sacrifices in our life because, again, it's not about me, it's about him. And I don't need to always be selfish and be thinking about what I want. I need to commit my life to what God wants. That's what he's talking about, making this sacrifice. So if or rather it was the love and the gratitude that this woman had 
for God. That's what made her repent. That brought her to repentance. It gave her a desire. I don't want to live that sinful life anymore. I want to live for God. I know I've messed up so bad, but I want to fix it. I want to make it right. So she had a love for God. She finally realized she needed to be thankful for all God had done for her, which she had taken for granted for all of that time. And so she now wants to live for God because she realized what he's done for her. So she's willing to obey God. She's willing to sacrifice for God. Sacrifice how? Willing to obey how? She's going to give up sin. She even sacrificed again with the expensive ointment. That probably cost her a lot of money, but she was willing to make a financial sacrifice. But more importantly, the spiritual sacrifice of giving up sin. I'm not going to live my life the way I want to live it. I'm going to live it the way God wants me to live it. And we all know there's a great reward waiting for us uh, if we do that. So this was the attitude that Simon needed. He didn't have it, but it's what he needed. And that's what Jesus is trying to point out to him with the parable. This woman that you look down your nose on, and yes, yeah, she's been a bad sinner, but... I'm going to forgive her for all her sins because she has shown genuine repentance. And Simon, you've got sin in your life and you need to take care of that just like this woman did. And he, he's trying to get Simon to see that. So we need to remember that God loves us. God is willing to forgive us if we'll demonstrate the same attitude that this sinful woman had. So tonight, if you're not a Christian, you need to be baptized into Christ. It's the only way that God will add you to the church. And if you have a need to do that tonight, we can do that for you. If, on the other hand, you have been a Christian, but you've fallen away, you've become mainly, maybe like this sinful woman. You've gone back in the world. You've committed sins against God of a public nature. You need to repent for those things. You need to confess the sin, repent for it. Ask for God's forgiveness, and he's promised that he'll forgive you. We can pray with you and for you, and you can be restored tonight to your first love. So if you have a need to become a Christian or to be restored, please come forward as together we stand and we sing. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now is spread. Ye famished, ye
great to see you all tonight. Hope to see you next time. As always, uh, before we continue on, do we have anyone to try that opportunity to thank the Lord for us? Remember all those on our prior list, keep them in our priors. Uh, remember, we have our strife going on in this whole world right now, and we're involved in it. Our country is involved in it, so we need to we need to fail our priors. I think we always need to say them, but we need to fail a lot too much to try to see that we don't get more involved in the stuff that's going on. So let's let's pray for that. Remember all those on our sick list. People in the fires, each and every one. We pray for these people. Pray for all of them. And pray for one another. Pray for all the people around us. And all the people. Remember, folks, it's ready tonight at 6 o'clock. Back here Sunday morning. Bible study about 9 30. You're ready to start the same way. Back here Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Please come. Please bring somebody with you. Turn to number five, ladies. Let's sign the first part of this and we'll have a closing part. This is my father's world and to my listening ears all nature sings and round me